Welcome to Know the Score with George Del Gobo, presented by the Columbus Symphony Orchestra. This week's Know the Score will focus on our upcoming concert featuring Beethoven's Seventh Symphony and Robert Schumann's Piano Concerto in A Minor, performed by guest artist Henry Kramer. Please enjoy this week's edition of Know the Score with George Del Gobo. We're looking forward to our concert on March 27th, which features two composers who personify the romantic period of music. First of all, there's uh, Beethoven, who was the great transitional figure between the classical music of the 18th century and the romantic music of the 19th century. And then there's Robert Schumann, who was the quintessential romantic composer and personality. We uh, are starting the concert with the piano concerto that Schumann wrote. It is the only piece that he wrote for piano and orchestra. Uh, He was uh, born into a family that uh, was kind of half in favor of music and half not. And even though he had musical training as a young boy, uh, he uh, went to law school because his uh, father, who was in favor of his musical training, died young, and his mother, who was opposed, uh, insisted that he go to law school. This is a case with a lot of classical composers. A lot of them end up in law school uh, before they focus their minds and realize that their, their career and their future lies in the world of music. And I suppose it's true even now today with a lot of uh, young people uh, thinking they want to be in music and in that world, in the performing arts world, and their parents shuddering and thinking, how will they ever make a living? What are they going to do? And uh, sometimes uh, not totally in favor of that pursuit. And that was the case with Schumann. And it wasn't until a couple of years of law school that he finally, his family relented and he was allowed to pursue his music studies uh, to continue them. Uh, He was a, a... an early achiever. He was a gifted young musician, and uh, his instrument, of course, was the piano. Um, He uh, was born in, I think, 1810, so he was born right in at the end of the flowering of romanticism in writing and in the the, the visual arts, and uh, right about at the beginning of the romantic period in music. So he was perfectly positioned to take up that mantle as the romantic composer. Um, He did not write any uh, instrumental music until later in his career. Uh, This piano concerto had a very, I don't want to say labored uh, beginning, but it didn't start out as a piano concerto. It started out as a a fantasy for piano that he wrote uh, for his wife, Clara. His wife, by the way, was also a gifted pianist and was the daughter of his principal piano teacher. Uh, who was against their marriage. Uh, So Schumann had a lot of uh, people against the things he wanted to do when he was maturing and growing up. Uh, But he he did finally marry Clara and uh, wrote pieces uh, for her. She was among the most gifted pianists of the 19th century and was very busy as a touring artist. Somehow they managed to have eight children uh, in their short marriage, all of but one who survived. And uh, this this fantasy for piano eventually, at Clara's suggestion, became a concerto. And it was, was the only concerto that he wrote for piano. And it was eventually uh, premiered in, I think, eight, 1845, something like that. And it is... Uh, pretty standard piece. The first movement, you can tell it was a an independent piece before it was included in the concerto because it has an ending that an independent piece would have. You could hear the first movement, which is the longest movement of the, of the piece, and then think, well, that's it. That's the end. But it isn't. It, it isn't anymore. And uh, it, It is basically a pretty standard concerto. The pianist enters after one big chord at the beginning of the piece, 
Um, and this was a, an effect that was imitated later on by Grieg in his concerto. He added a timpani roll to his one big chord, but uh, the pianist makes a startling entrance right after that one short burst of sound. <laughs> And the first theme of the movement is kind of an, a, a biographical theme. He chose notes that represented Clara's name. In Italian, her name would be Chiara. And so he chose uh, the notes C, B, and A and used them as, uh, in those days, in German, B is H. So it was C, H, A and use those notes at the beginning of the first theme of the first movement. Uh, this was a practice that a lot of composers did. Brahms did it and others. Uh, spelling out, Bach did it, 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 spelling out in their motives a, a word or a name that had particular significance for them. Um, the movement also has kind of evidence of... Uh, a practice that Schumann adopted in his literary career. I should say he was also, in addition to a fine pianist and composer, he was a, a writer of consequence uh, and an editor and uh, for a magazine and uh, had a, a considerable influence on people's thinking about art in, in the Romantic period. He adopted uh, two kind of alter egos who were called Floristan and Eusebius. Uh, and they represented Floristan on the one hand, impetuousness and passion, and Eusebius on the other hand, uh, more reason and rationalism and dreaminess even. And he would often pit these two against each other uh, in artistic discussions and so on, and included in his music as well um, themes and sections that represented that were representative of these two uh, differing, opposing characters. And th there's evidence of that in the first movement of, of this concerto. The second movement's a beautiful little intermezzo, uh, very unpretentious, filled with lovely melodies. The third movement is a kind of a dance like movement. It's in three or time, and it includes several famous passages uh, which, which uh, employ hemiola, and that is uh, taking a s three beats and making them into two. Uh, it's kind of hard to explain, but it's uh, very difficult to perform uh, with the pianist because he kind of just offsets the rhythm and offsets the stresses of the bars. Uh, to create a wonderful effect, but an effect that is sometimes difficult to coordinate with a pianist. We are very fortunate to have uh, Henry Kramer with us, and I don't think there'll be any problem there. If the pianist is not absolutely in rhythm, it can create problems, but I don't think we'll have that problem with Henry. Uh, Schumann had uh, a short life. He was... Uh, afflicted with mental illness uh, fairly early on, what is now considered to be bipolar disorder, uh, although no one is really certain about what, what his uh, diagnosis should be. Uh, there was also some talk of mercury poisoning, and in that time mercury was used to treat syphilis, um, and uh, syphilis was a very common uh, ailment at the time, and I don't know that mercury uh, had any effect on it, except that it would eventually kill the patient, and it's possible that uh, mercury poisoning contributed to his death. He attempted suicide uh, once uh, by trying to drown himself in the Rhine River. Uh, after that, he admitted himself to a mental institution, uh, and he died there after a couple of years. Uh, uh, supposedly pneumonia was a contributing factor to that. So a short life, but a very impactful one. 
uh, filled with beautiful music, beautiful songs, beautiful music for the piano, uh, and a good deal of instrumental music, some of which is fabulous and some of which is kind of awkward and difficult. He was not the greatest orchestrator, but the ethos that he expressed in his music comes through uh, no matter what. Beethoven, uh, on the other hand, was the great transitional figure, as I mentioned, between the classical music of Haydn and Mozart and the romantic music that took hold in the 19th century with composers like Mendelssohn and Schumann and then Wagner and Brahms and so on. Um, he wrote music in almost every category of music. He, he gave us incredibly long and wonderful sets of piano sonatas and string quartets. And in these, you can really get a sense of the journey that he took from his beginnings as a student in, in, of classical music and a student sort of of Haydn until his death in 1827, that the incredible artistic journey that, that, that occurs between the first string quartet and the last and the first piano sonata and the last. Uh, it's truly remarkable. Uh, the symphonies reflect that to a degree, but there aren't as many of them, and they're a little more traditional in a lot of ways. Uh, the first one, obviously, is a very classical-oriented piece, although there are hints that, that Beethoven is going to go into a different direction. The, uh, by the time we get to the Seventh Symphony, he was, of course, a pretty well-established composer, uh, he had, begin, had begun to have uh, serious problems with his hearing, as most everybody knows. And uh, in spite of all that, he wrote uh, a really optimistic and uh, happy and joyful uh, piece of music in the Seventh Symphony. It is uh, like the others in certain ways. It does have a slow introduction and uh, at the very beginning, and... Beethoven did this a couple of other times, mainly with the first and second symphony. Uh, after that, for the third symphony, he decided that he didn't need a slow introduction and he just used one chord as the introduction and the theme follows immediately. And that chord becomes very important rhythmically later on in the movement. Um, the, the fourth symphony had quite a long introduction, uh, but the fifth and sixth, not at all. Uh, so the seventh was his last kind of exploration of a, of a slow introduction to a sonata movement at the front of a symphony. It's a very long introduction, and it's very beautiful, and it has very little, if anything, to do with the music that follows in the first movement, which is basically in 6-8 time and is very, is, uh, very dance-like, very energetic, um, it flows very well. There's not a lot of angst here, like in some Beethoven symphonies. The second movement is probably one of Beethoven's most famous pieces. I'm sure you have heard it. If not uh, in a performance of this symphony, it has been used in many television commercials and movies as film scores and so on. Um, it starts off with a rhythmic ostinato of a long note followed by two short notes and then two long notes. So you hear bam, 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 over and over again. And this is harmonized, and so, which means there are other notes, it's not just one note. So it's, it's, it's kind of like a rhythmic and harmonic ostinato, like a, a Baroque Passacaglia, maybe something like that. And then over this, occurs uh, one of Beethoven's most beautiful melodies. And the whole movement progresses like that with these two elements being together. Uh, then there is a, a contrasting section, and then there is a fugue, uh, a little fugue, and, uh, and then the melody returns at the end. And, and then finally, at the end, it just disappears, as Beethoven was wont to do. He would take a theme and just disintegrate it at the end of a movement until it just and the movement ends the way it starts with a chord in the winds. The third movement is a colossal scherzo. The scherzo is, of course, a movement that replaced the minuet that used to be common in symphonies in the 1700s. And the scherzo is a livelier, uh, faster, usually, movement. Scherzo in Italian, of course, means joke. 
I don't know if there's anything funny about any of this music, uh, but it is very dance-like and very quick and very sprightly. And this is a very long scherzo uh, that alternates with a very slow uh, trio. Um, and finally, the fourth movement is a pretty much a whirling dance from beginning to end. Uh, filled with wonderful parts for everybody in the orchestra, especially for the horns who have some hair-raising entrances that they have to do and uh, playing in the very high register. Um, but it's all in all, it's a, a, a wonderfully joyous symphony and one that was very well received by the public. Uh, Beethoven conducted the premiere, even though he was almost totally deaf. And apparently his conducting was very, very demonstrative. He would jump around and throw his arms in the air and do all sorts of crazy things um, that I suppose reflected in his mind the music, but did very little to help the musicians actually actually play it. Um, it was so well received, especially the second movement, that that movement ha was, had to be played twice uh, at the uh, premiere performance. Audiences in those days were not as stuffy and formal, perhaps, as audiences today. Uh, we, we have kind of an etiquette now of concert going. You know, you're only supposed to clap at the end of a piece and all of this, and you have to be quiet and everything. Uh, in those days, uh, audiences clapped whenever they felt like it, and they weren't necessarily quiet. And it wasn't the kind of like the church service that some of our concerts are today. So... Uh, demanding that the second movement be played again because they enjoyed it so much was something that was commonly done and uh, uh, was certainly done at this time. And it's as a movement, as something, if you can imagine hearing it for the first time, uh, that you would want to hear again, that you, you would enjoy hearing it twice, especially since you had no other way to hear it. Uh, there was no way of electronically taking it home and listening to it or uh, anything else. Uh, so... That's Beethoven's seventh. Uh, together, those two pieces, I think, uh, make an evening of celebration and of happiness and joy at being able to gather again and play music and uh, uh, communicate with our audience the, the great thinking of uh, master musicians from past times. So we hope uh, that we'll see you there, and we look forward to it very much, and thank you for listening. We hope you enjoy this week's edition of Know the Score with George Del Gobo. If you are interested in supporting the CSO or purchasing tickets, please visit our website, csoga.org. And be sure to check out our new digital broadcast pass so you can enjoy the sounds of the CSO from the comfort of home.